Well, this morning, please turn in God's Word to the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 22. Today we will finish the book of 1 Kings, and we will be continuing into the book of 2 Kings. This morning, we don't look at as many verses, largely because the author of 1 Kings chooses not to focus the majority of his attention on King Jehoshaphat, uh, whom these verses pertain to, uh, but there are tremendous truths that we can see in this. The title of the sermon this morning is Almost Faithful, Almost Faithful, because that describes King Jehoshaphat's life. He was not an unbeliever. He was not a pagan. He was a man who believed in the Lord and we are told in some ways was faithful to the Lord, but he was almost faithful. In other words, there were tremendous flaws in his walk with the Lord. There were tremendous errors. I'm not saying he just made mistakes. I'm saying there are certain areas of his life which he did not subject in obedience to the Lord's command, and he was not completely faithful to what God had commanded him to do. And this morning, as I think of Jehoshaphat and how he wanted one foot in the church and one foot in the world, it reminds me that so many of us are often that way. Our heart desires to enjoy some of the enticements of the world. Our heart desires to have some fun, as if sin were fun or enjoyable, when in fact it is bitter and destroys and does not fulfill. It seems that so many are interested in seeing how close they can live for the world and how close they can get to hell and yet still go to heaven. It is really shameful because what we realize is that the scriptures are warning us that this world has nothing to offer us, and God has everything to offer us through his son, Jesus Christ. And if we would surrender to him, and if we would believe his word, we would realize that there is nothing that this world can give us that Christ has not already won for us on the cross. And so this morning in 1 Kings 22, I see in Jehoshaphat a warning to us not to be like him. He was a believer. I'm not sure if he was truly regenerate or born again. It seems by the things that are said about him that he likely was truly saved. And we likely will see him in heaven, those who are in Christ. But nonetheless, there were some big errors in his life, ones that we would be wise to avoid. 1 Kings 22, beginning in verse 41, the author has been focusing on King Ahab of Israel, and now he turns his focus to King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhi. He walked in all the way of Asa, his father, and Asa was a, a pretty good king. And so this is a compliment, this is, a, this is a, a good word. He walked in all the way of Asa his father. He, Jehoshaphat, did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And we read that and we think, wow, so, so he walked in the ways of Asa his father. He followed the Lord. He worshipped Yahweh alone. Yet... Continue reading in verse 43. Yet the high places were not taken away. And the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. Jehoshaphat also made peace with the king of Israel. Now let's stop right there. 
what in the world is he talking about the high places these were the altars that the people and some of the former kings had built all throughout the land of Israel and Judah in which the people who worshiped Yahweh would also go out and worship the other gods like Baal and Asherah and the Ashtoreth and they would go and they would sacrifice to these other gods all manner of different sacrifices and and Jehoshaphat was a man who tried to to follow the Lord and though he himself did not worship those other gods he didn't want to step on the toes of those who did you see he didn't believe in those other gods and he himself did not worship those other gods and that is good but the problem with Jehoshaphat was that he was too much of a coward to speak the truth he didn't want to offend men and women and we in America do not live under a theocracy the way that ancient Israel did what is a theocracy it is a system of government at which God of which God is the head we do not live in a theocracy I do not want a state church it's one of the reasons I'm proud of being a Baptist is because Baptists have stood firmly against a state church from their very inception and origin in the early 1600s and more than 400 years of Baptist history have shown that we as Baptists know the danger of having a state church however there was to be one theocracy in world history and only one and that was the ancient state of Israel in the ancient state of Israel under the old covenant in the Old Testament God had commanded that the kings would keep the religion of ancient Israel pure and not allow people to worship pagan gods. Now we in America rightly and according to the New Testament commands we do not try to compel men to worship the Lord but we seek to persuade men to worship the Lord. That is the word that Paul used. We persuade men and we seek to persuade you we do not want to force you we do not want to compel you we want you to freely choose to follow Jesus Christ however that is not the system of government that God had given ancient Israel and it was Jehoshaphat's job as king of Judah the southern kingdom of Israel it was Jehoshaphat's job as king to keep the religion pure and he was unwilling now who is charged with keeping our religion and our faith pure in these days who is it who is responsible for making sure that we worship the Lord Jesus Christ in truth well it is the responsibilities of all Christians but it's for first and foremost the responsibility of pastors the New Testament also refers to pastors as elders and overseers or bishops and those are three terms overseer and bishop or different translations of the same term pastor elder and overseer are three translations uh, three terms which refer to the same office of the New Testament the one we more commonly refer to as the pastor of the local church or the pastors within the local churches and I want you to hear some of the places where where the gospel in the New Testament tells us that it is the job of pastors to protect the church from heresy from false teaching from those who would seek to lead astray the church of Jesus Christ I'd like to begin with Jesus words in Matthew chapter 7 in Matthew chapter 7 beginning in verse 15 Jesus says this to his apostles who would be the leader of the church the leaders of the church and to the people who were there listening as he preached the Sermon on the Mount Matthew 7 15 Jesus says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous 
wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, and every diseased tree, that is the false prophet, he is a diseased tree, every diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. So how do you know the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher? You look at the fruit. You look at what they teach and how they live. Do they practice what they preach? And does, or is their practice and their preaching in a line and in accordance with the word of God? That is the question. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus spoke more about hell than any other person we are told about in Scripture. And Jesus warns that false teachers will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he sums it up by saying, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will be able to tell the difference between a false teacher and a true teacher. And the main way that you can tell the difference is by their fruits. How do they live? What do they say? Does it measure up to the standard of Scripture? Going on in the passage that I will be preaching today, this afternoon, as our former youth pastor Robert Gillis will be ordained as a pastor, I am asked to give the charge to the pastor. And there are a number of things that I will say this afternoon to Robert that I want the church that he pastors to hear. But, but I want you to hear what Paul says the job of the pastor is. First off, in Acts chapter 20, we see that in verse 17, Paul calls the elders of the church in Ephesus to come to him. As I said earlier, elders are pastors or overseers or bishops. These terms refer to the same office. And so the elders, the, the pastors of the church in Ephesus come to Paul who is traveling by ship and they come to the shore where, where he stops for a little while so that he can speak to them, preach to them, pray with them, and then go on his journey to Jerusalem. So they come out to meet him. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, listen to what Jesus says. He's been talking about how he's endured so many things for the sake of the gospel. And in Acts 20, verse 26, Paul says to these pastors, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Everything that God has revealed in his word, Paul says, I have preached. I have not avoided the difficult parts of scripture. I have not left certain doctrines unspoken of and untaught. But I have proclaimed to you the whole counsel of God. Are you getting an idea why I preach through books of the Bible verse by verse? Because it forces me to preach the whole counsel of God. That's one of the reasons. Verse 28, Paul goes on and says, he gives a warning to the pastors. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. The flock here is the church in Ephesus. They are pastors, which means shepherds. The church is considered a flock of sheep. And the pastors, the shepherds, are to oversee and care for and protect and feed the sheep. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy, Seer, Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. In other words, pastor, it's not your church, it's Jesus' church. He bought it with his own blood. Then in verse 29, Paul goes on and says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, that is even some of the pastors, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And whose job first and foremost is it to protect the church from false teachers and false teaching? It is the pastor's job. Lastly, I want you to hear the words of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5. These 
Oh, these words are, are, are in my mind and in my heart almost on a daily basis as I think of my tremendous responsibility as a pastor of a local church and as a preacher of the gospel. Peter says to the pastors in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. This is the word to pastor. He says, elders, your job is to pastor the flock of God that is among you, meaning the local church that God has entrusted a pastor to care for. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. This word oversight is to oversee or to be a bishop of, and it means to care for and look after the spiritual well-being of those within our churches. A pastor's job is to Make sure that you are not running from God, but are growing in your faithfulness to Him. That a pastor would not ignore the, the, the needs of the people in the church, especially their spiritual needs, but in love would even confront them lovingly about their sin and encourage them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. So, pastor, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief, chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And only if I had time to take you to 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus and Jude and 2 Peter where there are so many warnings about false teachers and how the church needs to be on guard and it is the pastor's job to see that the people are faithful to the Lord and to warn them about false teachers. And what was Jehoshaphat's responsibility under the old covenant that he would warn people about false teaching. It is the pastor's job under the new covenant that he would warn people about false teaching. And listen, I in my pulpit ministry have said some very clear things. In fact, last Sunday was a good example where I called out the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Those who would teach you to give money not out of worship, but out of a selfish, sinful, greedy desire to have more money for yourself, twisting what the scriptures say to try to make them say something which they do not. Brothers and sisters, when I stand before Jesus Christ on the day of judgment, I don't want to be guilty of not declaring the whole counsel of God and of being ashamed of the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you are ashamed of me before men, and if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father who is in heaven. In other words, my sheep hear my voice. They know me and they follow me, he said in John chapter 10. His sheep obey him, and they are not ashamed of his words. And if you are ashamed of his words and what he said, and the truths found in God's word, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that is an indication that you may not truly belong to him if you are ashamed of Christ and his words. I hope you see that my goal is not to upset people. My goal is to speak the truth in love, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4. We must speak the truth in love. Let me ask you a question. If someone were dying with cancer and I had the cure to that cancer in a syringe but that person is deathly afraid of needles now if, if I had the cure for cancer in this syringe and I don't know how to give someone a shot but let's say I had a nurse there who could And I didn't want to upset the person by saying, listen, I need, you to, I need to give you this shot. It will save your life. It will make the cancer go away. 
But then I said in my own heart, no, I can't do that to Bob. He's deathly afraid of needles. I don't want to upset him. I don't want him to be angry at me. I know I have the cure to his horrible disease that is eating away at his body, but I just, I don't want to upset him. Would it be loving of me to not tell him about the cure and to keep it to myself because when I first share the cure with him, it might scare him and hurt him temporarily? He might even get upset at me and offended that I would even show him a needle because he's so deathly afraid of a needle. No, if I love him, I will say, Bob, listen. I, I know that what I'm about to say might hurt at first, but I love you and I want to see your life saved. I have the cure for cancer. It's in a needle. I know you're afraid of needles, but if you allow this nurse to give you this shot, it will cure you of your cancer. Listen, every person without exception has a spiritual disease which is eating away at their soul and it is far more deadly and horrible than cancer. That spiritual disease is known as sin. And while we may not have the cure to cancer, we do have the cure for sin. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how dare we, out of self-preservation and a supposed love for all people, keep that cure to ourselves, so that others will not get upset at us when we share the truth with them, which could save their souls. You have to love people enough to share the truth with them, to risk your relationships with them, and not be a coward like King Jehoshaphat, who although he knew the cure, did not want to share it with others for fear that his reputation might be damaged and people might get angry. And it was the most selfish thing that he could have done not to protect and preserve the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And how we do the same today. And then we get, a, we get mad at a preacher or a person who would warn us about false teaching and dangerous deceptions in this world and who would give straight words on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the reality of heaven and hell. And we say things like, you stop judging people. Jesus told us that we should judge with righteous judgment. But nobody has memorized that verse from John's gospel. Everyone has memorized Matthew 7 verse 1, judge not lest you be judged. And they don't read the verses afterward, afterward which say that we must first take the log out of our own eye so that we can see clearly to judge and take the speck of dust out of our brother's eye. Jesus did not say that we should never exercise judgment, but what he says is you can't be a hypocrite, you must practice what you preach. And then and only then can you help your brother. But no, we want to twist the words of Jesus because it's much easier to only have objections and no answers. To take a stand on nothing. I heard one person put it this way. Today, the only heresy is to say that there is such a thing as heresy. Oh, as long as you believe everyone is right and everyone is going to heaven, then you're good. But the moment that you say that this is the word of God, this doctrine, this teaching in scripture is true, and those who deny it do not believe the truth, the moment you take a stand, someone is bound to get offended. And so we are ashamed of the gospel and of the truth in God's word and we don't want to share the truth with our neighbor because they might get upset at me. Well, listen, they're going to perish in eternal hell if they don't know Jesus Christ and how will they hear unless someone like you goes and preaches to them, Paul asked in Romans 10. How are they going to be saved if you don't ever tell them the cure? And all they hear in this world is a false gospel which does not save souls but condemns men and women's souls to eternity in hell. Listen, it's not loving to refuse to stand on the truth of God's word. It is cowardice and selfishness. 
The most selfish thing that you can do as a Christian is to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ to yourself. So let's not pretend like it's loving because it is the opposite of love. They will perish in hell and out of self-preservation, you don't want to share with them eternal life. You want it for yourself, but you're not willing to make any sacrifices so that they might have it too. That is the very definition of selfishness. And that is how Jehoshaphat was. The high places were not taken down. On these high places, they would make all manner of sacrifices, the most egregious of which we have already seen in 1 Kings was that many would sacrifice their children alive to a pagan god. And yet preachers today are not supposed to talk about these most controversial parts of our culture. Preachers today are supposed to ignore that every day in our country 3,500 babies are murdered in abortion clinics and we're supposed to just not upset people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a preacher who lived in Germany in the 1930s and 40s and was a pastor. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up against Adolf Hitler. It cost him his life. He was executed for speaking out against Hitler. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, these words, Silence in the face of evil is its self-evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Do you understand what that means? You have the gospel of Jesus Christ and you keep it to yourself you say, I'm not going to speak. You've already spoken. And what you have said is, is I care more about myself than these people who are perishing. And I don't want to share the truth with them because I'm too afraid of them. It also reminds me of these words in John's gospel. They haunt me so much. Listen in John's gospel. As Jesus has been preaching in John chapter 12, Jesus has presented the gospel. And we're told in John 12 verse 42, that many of the authorities believed in Jesus, many of the officials and those in high places, powerful, prominent men, many of the authorities believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, those men who were Jesus' enemies, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. What did they not confess? Jesus and his words. They were ashamed of Jesus and they were ashamed of his words. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Does that describe you? Do you love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God? Are you more concerned about pleasing man or God? Which is it? Because it's one or the other. Who are you more afraid of? Jesus Christ on the day of judgment or your neighbor who may get offended with you if you share the gospel with him or her? Who are you more afraid of? This so well describes King Jehoshaphat. He knew the truth. He just didn't want to take a stand for it. It would have cost him too much. And how so many of us are like that today. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you would understand that this is what motivates me as a pastor. This is what drives me. Love for God and for his children. I'm not here to upset people. I'm here to shepherd the flock of God. My goal is not to make people angry, but look, Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. When the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. They don't hate you because of you. They hate you because of me and my words. The, light hate, the darkness hates the light. That's part of the cost of discipleship. That's what it requires for you to follow, what is required of you if you would follow Jesus Christ that you would be willing to endure anger, broken relationships, 
suffering, even persecution, because there is a great cost in following Jesus Christ. But in selfishness, we want to tone down the gospel and pretend as if it's all okay. One of the things, and I, I'm going to say this today, and I tell you what, instead of getting angry at me, please look into this for yourself. One of the things that upset me so much this week, as Pope Francis visited America, was how so many of my fellow Southern Baptist pastors, oh, they just fell in line. Oh, they just praised the Pope and everything he was saying. Now listen, a lot of what the Pope said was right and good. A lot of it wasn't. Let me explain something to you. He has the right to believe what he wants to believe. He has the right to preach it however he chooses. But the gospel of Rome is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rome teaches a gospel by which Rome and its saints have earned grace that they can give you through the sacraments of the church and that if you would receive those sacraments and be faithful enough and do enough good works that God through the Roman church will give you enough grace that you might be able to enter heaven. And we have Southern Baptist pastors celebrating the Pope's arrival and being there to greet him. You know how disgusted I was with Rick Warren as he was there to receive Pope Francis and say he is the Pope of all evangelicals? No, he's not. He's not my Pope. The head of my church is Jesus Christ. And I do not say that in anger or in hatred for anyone. It's just the truth. We have so many today who are Protestants of convenience, not Protestants of conviction. They have no idea the differences between the gospel of Rome and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why I love and respect my Roman Catholic neighbors and family members, please hear me. I do not say this in a vacuum. If you know me, you know that much of my own family is Roman Catholic. That you would understand that I say this because I love them. And I want them to know the truth. And I'm not angry at them. I care about them. And I will not lie to them and tell them that a false gospel is the true gospel. I won't do it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not one through which we earn our salvation through works and sacraments of some institution. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one in which the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God, the Son, took on human flesh and he came to this world and he lived among men a perfect life without sin and he is the only one to have ever lived without sin and that means that Mary was not sinless she was a great woman of God she was described as faithful but when she calls Jesus her savior in Luke chapter 2 it's because she understood that she needed a savior from her sin why else was she in the temple offering sacrifices for her sin in Luke 2? Because she knew she needed a Savior. She knew she needed God's grace and forgiveness. Jesus is the Son of God in human flesh. He lived a perfect life. And he died in the place of sinners on the cross. He shed his blood to pay for their sins. He was buried, but three days later he rose from the grave conquering sin and death and hell and securing eternal life for all who will repent of their sins and place their faith in him. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one day he is coming again. Listen, we can love people and still disagree with them. We are be, being told a lie today that you cannot disagree with a person without hating them. That's so crazy. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's it, what we are told that we have to say that everyone is right. Everything is true. There is no such thing as error. There is no such thing as heresy. Every way leads to heaven. And we are expected to get in line. I wonder what all the 
Christian martyrs throughout the 2,000 years of the church would think about our cowardice today. Men who were burned alive. Men whose bodies were ripped in two. Men whose bodies were sawn in two. Men and women who were thrown to lions. Men who were impaled on forks and burned alive. Their bodies coated in oil and set on fire. I wonder what they would say about our cowardice. I wonder what those early Baptists who languished in English and Massachusetts and Connecticut prisons for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder what they would say to us in our cowardice today. A man like Obadiah Holmes, who because he dared to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without the permission of the Massachusetts Bay Colony government, and because he dared to say that salvation is for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and not for infants. And he was imprisoned. And he was told that if he or someone would pay the fine, that he would be released. And if he would recant what he had said and no longer preach what he believed, but get in line with the state church and what others expected him to believe, then he would be released. And Obadiah Holmes begged the other Baptist, please don't pay my fine. I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ in his words. And so they led him to the whipping post there in the Boston Square. And they tied him to the whipping post and they took a leather whip and they beat him over and over on his back until there were wounds and he was bleeding. And at the end of it, do you know what he said? You have whipped me as with roses. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder what he would say to us today. A Baptist forefather like Obadiah Holmes. What would he think about a Southern Baptist convention in which its, its most prominent preachers are celebrating the arrival of the Pope? He is our Pope. I saw that one of our Southern Baptist leaders, Ed Stetzer, said in an interview yesterday, Oh, thank God for the faithfulness of the Roman Catholic Church. I was listening to an interview this week on Fox News on Hannity, and I heard the preacher of First Baptist Church of Dallas, Robert Jeffress. He was asked what he thought about the Pope said, and the first words of it, out of his mouth were, he is a humble Christ follower, declaring the pastor of one of the largest churches in our country and certainly one of the largest in the Southern Baptist Convention that the Pope is a humble Christ follower and therefore he represents a true church and the gospel. How else could you be a follower of Christ? Listen, if you're ashamed of Jesus Christ and his words, think of what scripture teaches is a man who calls himself the Holy Father, a Christ follower who is humble. Holy Father is found in the Bible. You know who it's used of? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is called the Holy Father. The vicar of Christ is what the Pope is called. Do you know what the word vicar means in Latin? In place of Christ. He's also called an altar Christus. Do you know what the word altar Christus means? Another Christ. Do you believe there is another Christ? According to the Pope, there is, and it is him. Oh, no, no, these things are true. You may not have heard them before, but this is what they teach. And to pretend as if that's the same faith that we who believe the Bible, which contains the true gospel of Jesus Christ, hold, it is a lie. That is not what the Bible teaches. Now, I love my Roman Catholic neighbors and friends. But you ask any priest and they will tell you that they do not believe what Baptists believe or other Protestants believe. I mean, can we not be that honest and just say it? We have different beliefs. We're not the same. And you have your right to believe what you believe and practice it. And I have my right to believe mine. And on the day of judgment, we will find out what the truth is. I believe the truth is contained in God's word, not in any human tradition. You believe otherwise, that's fine. You're free to worship as you so choose. But you will give an answer for it on the day of judgment. 
Why can't we speak the truth in love in that way? Surely some will be upset with me today for speaking so plainly about these things. Is that what God's word commands me to do? To mince words? To not speak the truth out of fear of man and what people may think? To be ashamed of what the Bible says and what Jesus said? Is that what God wants me to do? That's what Jehoshaphat did. I'm not here to upset anyone today. I'm here to speak the truth. And I would encourage you, instead of getting upset at me, to go and search these things out for yourself. So few people know what anyone teaches and what the Bible teaches. I would encourage you to look at these things for yourself. It's amazing today. It's, we're okay with calling something not true as long as I don't know someone who believes it, right? So if I were to stand up here today and say Hinduism isn't true, well, how many of you know any Hindus? I know a few, but not many. If I were to stand up here and say Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not represent the church of Jesus Christ. How many would get offended? Probably not many. Why? Because you probably don't know any. If I were to stand up here today and say Mormonism is not the true gospel, how many would be offended? Probably not many. Why? Mostly because you don't know any Mormons. You may know some. I know some as well. You see, we tend to decide what's true and false according to who we know and not according to what the Bible says. We decide what we'll speak out against by how much cost there is in speaking the truth. So if you live in an area where there is a large population of Mormons like Salt Lake City, Utah, then maybe you don't speak the truth. Maybe you go after a, a, a religion that no one around there believes in. Maybe you don't talk about Roman Catholicism in Louisiana because it's so prominent or oneness Pentecostalism which denies salvation by grace through faith and denies the doctrine of the Trinity because you don't want to upset someone who believes those things. Or should we speak the truth in love? Not with anger, not with bitterness, not with hatred, but speak the truth in love. Please think about those things. Please think about Jehoshaphat, a man who believed the truth but didn't want to stand against a lie. Is God pleased with that? I need to finish. 1 Kings 22. I want to continue in verse 45. It says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And from the land, the land he exterminated the remnant of the male cult prostitutes who remained in the days of his father Asa, he did one good thing. He got rid of the male cult prostitutes. I don't want to go into detail about this. I mentioned it once before when it came up in 1 Kings, but male cult prostitutes were, were men who uh, were paid to have intimate relationships with other men. And um, Jehoshaphat did remove them from the land. And so that's one good thing he did. Verse 47. There was no king in Edom. A deputy was king. Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold. But they did not go, for, they were the, sh for the ships were wrecked at Ezion Geber. What happened? How were the ships destroyed? Why was he going to go to Ophir to get gold? Well, this is where it's helpful to know what the other books of the Bible say. In 2 Chronicles, we are told far more about King Jehoshaphat than we are in 1 Kings. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning in verse 35, this is what the chronicler tells us. And after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, joined with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted wickedly. And he, Jehoshaphat, joined with him, Ahaziah, in building ships to go to Tarshish. And they built the ships in Ezion Geber. And Eliezer, the son of Dodavahu of Merishah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, 
Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. How were the ships destroyed? God destroyed them. How did he do it? We're not told. Maybe a storm, a hurricane, a tornado. I don't know. But God destroyed the ships that he was building. Why? Because Jehoshaphat was allying with a pagan king, a Haziah of Israel, who had taught his people to worship other gods. And God said, have nothing to do with them. Don't partner with them. And that's exactly what he did. And so God destroyed the ships and they sank. As we finish up, let's look at verses 51 to 53 so we can know about this man Ahaziah that Jehoshaphat was partnering with. We're told in verse 51, Now Ahaziah the son of Ahab began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. He, Ahaziah, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, that would be Ahab, and in the way of his mother, Jezebel, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And he, Ahaziah, served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. That's who Jehoshaphat allied with. Why? Well, it was his sister nation. And you don't want to upset your friends. So you go along with that. Because it's easier to go along with the sinful, depraved flow of our society than to paddle against it and to proclaim the truth. Oh, it's so easy to go downstream and just say, well, I don't want to upset anyone or judge anybody. I love them. I'll keep the truth to myself and I'll partner with them. Listen to what God's prophet said to Jehoshaphat the first time he allied with an evil king. 2 Chronicles 19. 2 Chronicles 19 verse 1 tells us, Jehoshaphat the king of Judah returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. This is after he defeated uh, the armies with Ahab. After the war uh, that he went to with King Ahab. It says, But Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, that is one of God's prophets, he went out to meet with him, King Jehoshaphat, and he said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Listen. When he speaks of loving them, what he's talking about here is in, 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 in joining in with them and taking part in what they do. He's not talking about the general love that God has for all of creation and all people in which he desires what is best for them. But he's talking about loving what they love and doing what they do and refusing to stand for the truth. And God says, should, should you partner with the wicked and help those who hate the Lord? No. And yet, is that not what so many do today? Jehoshaphat was almost faithful. He believed the truth. He just didn't want to stand for it. What about you? You believe these things are true. Are you willing to take a stand? Are you willing to share the gospel with your neighbor, though there is great risk in it? Do you love them enough to share the truth with them? As we close this morning, I don't want you to be focused on me and what I said. I want you to be focused on what God's word says. If you feel like I was out of line in what I said here today, let me ask you to do this. Search the scriptures. Go back and reread these passages and what they say. Because if I did not preach what the Bible says, then you don't have to believe it. But if what I said here today is consistent with the word of God, then you are bound to believe it. You are required to believe it. So as you leave here today, the question is this. Are you willing to?
to stand for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you going to be like King Jehoshaphat who knew the truth but didn't want to stand for it because the cost was too high? I pray that you'd be like Elijah, a man who boldly stood for the truth of God no matter what. I pray you'd be like Micaiah who says what the Lord says, that I will speak. I'm not going to say what other men tell me to say. I'm going to say what God has spoken. Who will you be like? Lastly, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never repented of your sins and placed your faith in the one who left heaven and came to this earth to die in the place of sinners and rose from the grave, if you've never placed your faith in him, I invite you to do so now before it is too late. And I will tell the truth with you to you, you you may not have another opportunity. You may spend an eternity separated from Christ in a real place called hell. And as Paul said, I will be guilty. I will be innocent of your blood because I did not neglect to preach to you the whole counsel of God. So it's in your hands. What will you do? Will you turn to the one the one alone who can save you? Or will you go with the flow and refuse to pay the price of following Jesus Christ? I pray that you'd follow him. I pray that you'd be faithful to him. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you today for your word, for the gospel by which we are saved. And I pray today that I would not get in the way of your words and what the scripture says. but that I would only teach and preach the truth. And Lord, if I've done otherwise, forgive me and lead your people to see what the truth is found in your word. But I pray that every one of us would leave here today searching the scriptures to see if these things were so, just like the Bereans did in Acts 17. And that when we see the truth in your word, that we would not be ashamed of it, and that we would love others enough to tell them the truth, even though it may cost so much. Help us to be faithful, not almost faithful, but sold out to the one who bought us with his own blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. If you need to come forward, you do so at this time.